Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello and uh, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm Peter Lee and I'm the head of Microsoft Research USA. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce this morning's plenary speaker, Dr. Herman Hauser. Uh, Dr. Hauser is a physicist and I hope you won't hold that against him. He, uh, he's actually a physicist of some, uh, some quite uh, nice distinction, uh, holding a PhD from the University of Cambridge uh, and also a fellow of the Institute of Physics and the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, but what is equally interesting about Dr. Hauser are his entrepreneurial exploits. And in 1997, he founded Amadeus Capital Partners, and from there, uh, founded or co-founded numerous interesting and winning technology companies. Uh, maybe uh, one of quite some note and uh, possibly having an impact on all of your lives uh, is Acorn Computers, which uh, spun out the arm. Uh, yesterday, in discussions with Dr. Hauser, I was really amazed to learn that last month alone, there were more ARM chips shipped than in the entire history of Intel chips, which is quite an amazing uh, fact. And so the impact and transformation on the world has been quite uh, stupendous. Uh, of course, there are many other companies of note, uh, including um, ActiveBook, Toby, Verada, Cambridge Network Limited, and many more. In recognition uh, for all of his accomplishments in the transformation of technologies on society, uh, last year he became a uh, fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, today, uh, I think you should really look forward to uh, a talk from a man who has an established record and a great nose for technologies that are interesting, transformational, and uh, maybe most importantly of all, winning. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Herman Hauser. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for, this, uh, for these kind words of introduction. It's not actually last month, it's last year uh, that we sold nine billion arms, and I'll go uh, into this uh, um, <clears throat> a little later. Uh, on, the, on the subject of um, investing in successful companies, uh, I, I, I'm in the position of sharing with you the secret that I learned uh, <clears throat> of what really makes a, a successful company, since I'm one of the very few people in the world who's made uh, more than a hundred investments and therefore arguably I have a, a better data set than most and um, the secret that I want to share with you uh, is that it's random. <laughs> uh, so uh, here is the pretentious part of uh, a title of my talk, uh, uh, you know, it's the sixth wave is really machine learning uh, but you know the pretentious way of uh, thinking about it is really reducing the the human a part of the commulgar of uh, a complexity of whatever you're doing. So here is the, the, the content. Uh, as every good computer scientist, when you've got six waves of computing, you start with the zeroth. Um, <clears throat> then I'll, I'll talk about the, the six, about the clash of waves. Uh, you know, for people who've been around for a little while, it's quite interesting that when you stand, stand back and you look at these waves, that you can actually discern wave characteristics uh, that are the same uh, wave after wave after wave, and one of the most interesting ones is the, the change uh, between the leading companies in these waves, and there is no uh, historic uh, um, incidence or, or um, occasion where a lead company in one wave ever makes a significant contribution to the next wave, and I'll go into this when we we'll talk about the uh, relationship between Intel and ARM. <clears throat> Uh, so, let's start with the zeroth wave, uh, and uh, we're rebuilding the EDSAC. Uh, some of you might uh, know about the EDSAC. It's, of course, the world's first computer. Uh, there are so many people claiming the world's first computer. Well, it's the first computer that was designed for users. <clears throat> EDSAC stands for Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator. 
Uh, some of you might know what a computer was in those days. Of course, it was a person uh, who did the computing. So these things were calculators. It was constructed by a famous computer scientist uh, called Morris Wilkes. Uh, the main memory in there was a mercury delay line. So it was also uh, the first computer that had stored programs. Uh, there was a very, another famous professor at Cambridge called David Wheeler who invented the subroutine. And concepts like job queue, for example, came from the EDSAC because there's a, a wonderful picture of people queuing up with their paper tapes to put the paper tape into the paper tape reader. And that was the job queue of, of the people that queued up to do their paper tapes. One interesting sort of statistic on the EDSAC is that it had uh, 650 IPS. So these are instructions per second, not MIPS as we're used to, million instructions per second, uh, which isn't a lot, although it clocked at a, um, uh, at a megahertz, uh, which uh, is interesting. Of course, it was a, a serial computer, a one-bit computer. It's one of the reasons why it slowed down. But the other one was that the main memory was this mercury delay line. So the way you uh, executed the, the next instruction or you waited for the next data is you had to wait for the sound waves in the, in the mercury delay line to make, all the, make it all the way around to get the next uh, datum. So that's why it's 650 instructions per second. However, arguably, <clears throat> at that time, uh, the increase in compute power that was available to users was a factor of 1,500. And arguably, this was the biggest step increase in compute power that we ever had from one year to the next. Because you know Moore's law and factor of two every two years or so. But this was a factor of 1,500 over the, the hand computers that we had. Another important aspect of the EDSAC is uh, 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 you know, the fact that it really was constructed for users, not for computer scientists uh, uh, to do demos. And it actually contributed to three Nobel Prizes. And here it is. Uh, it's, uh, of course, vacuum tubes. Uh, is this a laser pointer? No. Um, here, <clears throat> you see the mercury delay line. <laughs> it is really remarkable how this worked. So the way, this was the only storage uh, in, in, in this design. And the way it stored the data is there were, there were these long pipes of mercury, and you banged it at one end, and this, this wave, this acoustic wave, traveled to the other end. Uh, you know, and there was a, a piezoelectric receiver, and you could get the data out. And it had a total storage capacity of a, a kilobyte, I think. Uh, but what I really want to concentrate on today, talking about these six waves, is the way it felt to the user. And that's where the big shift is coming in, and that's where I think machine learning really is the next step in the, in the evolution of computing, uh, because <clears throat> we're moving closer to the human. We'll, we'll uh, you know, have interfaces that are just better suited to uh, human interface. But starting off, the user interface was not very human friendly because the only way you could put any data in there is with your paper tape. The only way you could program it uh, was in machine code. And the only help you got expressing your thoughts is uh, David Wheeler's invention of the subroutine. I mean, somebody had to invent the subroutine, it was David. So it's a bit better, you know, if you, if you wanted to calculate squares and you had a subroutine that did the squares, you know, it saved you a little bit of time, but not a lot. A lot. So here is the, the six real waves of computing, if you like. Mainframe, mini computer, workstation, personal computers. Very unexpectedly, smartphones and the cloud have really become the main computing platform now in terms of uh, usage. And uh, of course, the, the whole talk is that the, that the next big evolution in terms of the usage of computing worldwide is this ubiquity, a ubiquitous computing, uh, uh, sometimes called the Internet of Things. But actually, the key enabler, the key driver, is the, the, the ease of use that will um, result from uh, machine learning. So let's uh, take a whistle-stop tour of what, what happened so far. Um, some of you might remember the IBM 370. It cost about a million pounds. Uh, there were about a 1,000 of them per year. And note those two, they, they are sort of wave characteristics. Everything roughly changes by, by an order of magnitude as we go through the w waves. There's this interesting pendulum between 
multi-user computers where the computing is done somewhere centrally and then personal computers where you do the computing locally. Uh, the way you interfaced uh, with it was first uh, punch cards, then terminals. And uh, there was a very interesting lock-in effect, uh, and this is a wave characteristic. You start off with a bunch of companies. It was literally the bunch, uh, uh, Burroughs, Univac, uh, NCR, uh, Control Data, I think, and Honeywell. But you often end up with a monopoly, in this case, IBM. And I remember <clears throat> Rob Wilmot, who ran ICL, the British computer company at the time, complaining bitterly that there was no way of, uh, of attacking IBM because IBM had the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the hardware interface to the DASI disk, and they weren't allowed to use that interface. And you may remember the court cases at the time that finally forced uh, IBM to... Uh, open up the DAS, the interface specification, and whenever you've got these court cases, and you'll see where I'm going through the waves so you can see them now, uh, this normally marks the end of a wave. And when somebody wins the court case against IBM here or uh, uh, against other companies now, it just shows the end of a wave, that, that actually it has become uh, irrelevant, and another thing is really becoming a, a new driver. So what was the user interface to these mainframes? Well, it was punch cards and teletypes in terms of the input. But uh, what, what the user saw really was Fortran and COBOL, and maybe some science libraries. Uh, you know, when I was a PhD student but doing my PhD, I used uh, you know, splice uh, functions and things that, 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 that they made available. And of course, on the business side, it was the business forums. But then came the mini-computer, again dominated by a company called DEC, absolutely wonderful company at the time. If anybody had said that DEC was going to get into trouble with uh, the domination of mini-computers that they had, all the bright people that they uh, had, uh, it, it was completely laughable, and yet uh, DEC is no more. So what happened? Price reduced by a factor of 10 from a million to 100,000. Units went up by a factor of 10 from 1,000 per annum to 10,000 per annum. Uh, but really, the, the most important thing was the widening of the use of computers uh, and uh, changes in the user interface. So the VDUs appeared, um, CAD tools appeared, uh, both mechanical, electrical, and software tools, of course. Uh, uh, this was the time when the... When, um, the, the car industry started adopting mechanical CAD tools, and some of that actually happened in, in Cambridge. Most of the BMW or Mercedes cars uh, are, are produced with software that was actually in, um, invented in Cambridge. And networks appeared, uh, uh, like the uh, Ethernet. But then there was a new belle du jour called a workstation, uh, and this is the iconic uh, uh, computer of the time, of course, the Sun. Uh, Spark Station, uh, which was really a, a, a sort of a development of the, the Alto at uh, Xerox Park. Uh, <clears throat> and the uh, same thing happened again. Price went down by a factor of 10, units went up by a factor of 10, uh, and the use space widened. And there's also the first appearance of uh, risk in, um, uh, in the workstation. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, if you look at the user interface, the desktop appeared uh, with the mouse. It became a sort of a personal machine, really, uh, more than a multi-user machine. And there was this, uh, this famous 3M um, uh, concept. I think it was um, Forrest Basket who um, uh, characterized that one MIPS, one million instructions per second, one megabyte of memory, and one megapixel of display, so that you had uh, a high-quality display, that, and some people added a fourth, which was a megapenny. And again, Ethernet played an important role. And then, unexpectedly, uh, the personal computer appeared, and uh, uh, if you uh, allow me a, a little trip down memory lane, this is uh, my first company, Acorn Computers, which produced the BBC Micro. And... Uh, uh, although ARM is probably the company that I'm best uh, known for as the, the godfather of the ARM, uh, it's actually uh, the BBC Micro that I'm most proud of because it became the standard in British schools and created a whole generation of programmers uh, in Britain. So at the time, we arguably had more programmers and more people 
who are being taught programming uh, than any other country in the world. And many of our games companies or uh, companies like Autonoma, Mike, Mike Lynch still remembers the, um, uh, all the assembler codes for the 6502, which was the uh, uh, microprocessor at the time. And those of you who are interested in this uh, uh, period of history, there is actually a BBC docudrama, as they call it, called Micromen, which, uh, um, which shows what happened during that period. There's a very interesting um, uh, follow-on to the BBC Micro, uh, which is called Raspberry Pi, uh, that has, uh, uh, when the Raspberry Pi people came to me and said, uh, look, this is, this is really what we need of the BBC Micro that educates people on how to use computers, how to use hardware, how to create the next generation of programmers, uh, not just in Britain and the world. Uh, we want to have this $25 a computer that uh, can do everything that uh, you know, computers do. I, 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 they asked me for advice, and my advice was, this is a stupid idea. First of all, you've got to change the name. Nobody will ever remember Raspberry Pi. It's a stupid name. And, and secondly, why would people want to buy $25 computers uh, that, you know, that look like a bare circuit board? Um, of course, as so often, my predictions were totally wrong. Uh, Raspberry Pi has actually become a, a fantastic uh, brand. Um, uh, we, they expected to, uh, as we did with the BBC Micro, we expected to sell about uh, 10 to 100,000 in the first year. Well, they've sold well over a, over a million. It's become a real phenomenon. Lots of people are building lots of things around the Raspberry Pi. The Pi, by the way, stands for for Python, uh, so actually you should have a Y, but anyway. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's a great success, and it's very, very exciting. However, the iconic uh, product during the PC wave was this machine, the IBM PC. And to just give you a feeling for how, uh, and this is not very long ago, on how primitive this machine was, look at the user interface here. This is what you saw when you switched to an IBM PC. There was a green screen. It was a, a command line. Uh, there, there wasn't really any, any desktop yet, because uh, Windows uh, uh, hadn't, uh, hadn't appeared yet. Uh, but the, most, uh, the best demonstration of how fast uh, computers have developed and how fast hardware uh, has improved really is the main storage of this computer. There are two floppy disks in there. Does anybody remember the, the memory capacity of a floppy disk? No. It was about 200 kilobytes. So both of them would give you 400 kilobytes, which was the total main storage of the PC. Just to remind you, this is not enough to hold a single picture that you take with your uh, uh, <coughs> mobile phones every day. You couldn't store a single picture in the entire computer. So again, wave characteristics. Price went down by a factor of 10 to, uh, to a kilodollar. Uh, numbers went up to 100 million, again, by a factor of uh, 100. Um, the interesting thing was that uh, the use case changed again, and uh, uh, productivity tools uh, uh, became the driver of uh, computer sales as, of course, you know very well uh, with um, Office. And I remember going to Esther Dyson's conference, and we had, we had these conferences that were all about feature wars. And the feature wars were between the different uh, productivity uh, tools. Uh, war was between Lotus 1 to 3 and Microsoft Excel. And every, uh, every year, uh, you know, Bill would get up and said, this is what Excel now does, and it's so much better than Lotus 1 to 3. And then Mitch Kapoor gets up and says, no, 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 we now have a better Lotus 1, 2, 3, because you know, we can do pivot tables or, or something. So this, this, this fascinated the PC industry. Again, something that you think, you know, what's the big deal? This is uh, it's not really where the action is or what's, uh, what's interesting. But this was what, where the action was and what was interesting at the time. Um, we also, towards the end of the uh, personal computer um, uh, wave, as always, we have almost monopoly uh, suppliers, in this case, I Intel on the CPU and, of course, uh, Microsoft uh, with Windows. But what's the user interface, which has come a little bit closer to uh, the human? There's the desktop user interface, Office I talked about. 
but it's not just office. There was then a, a, a great plethora of heavyweight uh, applications, I would say, like Photoshop or, uh, uh, you know, again, CAD applications. But then a new thing happened, which completely changed the, uh, the use base of, um, of PCs, which was the internet and the browser and things that you could do um, uh, on top of that, and of course, uh, Google, the search, and now uh, social. Uh, <clears throat> but there were also uh, breakthroughs, uh, again, that, uh, of course, you know uh, a lot about, like Connect. Uh, you know, people got used to the mouse and the, um, uh, and the keyboard, but to be able to interface uh, with the computer through gestures and, 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 and your body uh, was really something quite uh, revolutionary. And, uh, and it is wonderful what uh, you've done with uh, Connect introducing this to the computing environment. There is another thing that's uh, happening uh, with a company called Toby that uh, we have uh, made an investment in just to um, disclose uh, uh, this clearly. And this is eye tracking. Toby is the world's leading eye tracking company with about a 50% market share. It's a little company, $50 million company, not, not a startup anymore. And for, for over a decade, they have refined this, um, this uh, ability to track your eyes. Eye tracking is actually not the correct term. The correct term is gaze tracking, because it doesn't track your eyes. It actually tracks where you look. And <clears throat> again, along the path of making computers closer to humans, uh, eye tracking or gaze tracking turns out to be very important in human-to-human -human interactions. Because, uh, uh, you know, if I gave the talk like this, <laughs> it, you know, you'd, you and I would feel uncomfortable about this. You, you just expect me to look at you. And I expect you to look at me, but you don't always do that. Uh, <clears throat> so the next, um, next big wave, which really, and, and, and these waves always come left field. This is a, another interesting thing. They, the, the reason why the incumbents, why the, 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 the monopoly suppliers towards the end of the wave always miss the next wave is that it's an, always an unexpected wave. And who would have thought that phones would become the main computing environment? It was just a very alien thought because that's not what computers were. Computers were, you know, laptops towards the end of the... Uh, but this guy, uh, you know... Not the nicest guy when you've uh, met him, <laughs> but uh, you know, he, 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 he almost single-handedly really revolutionized the, um, uh, the phone industry with the, uh, with the iPhone. So, let's go back to the wave characteristics. Price, uh, well, went down to zero. You can get a, a phone for free now if you're willing to sign up to a contract. Numbers, again, went up by a factor of 10 from hundreds of millions to now billions. <clears throat> Last year, it was about one and a half billion. Uh, <clears throat> use case widened. Uh, voice, of course, uh, was the starting point with phones. Uh, but with smartphones, <clears throat> uh, I, I think it has just happened that more people now access the internet via a smartphone that, than, than via PCs. And then, again, very unexpected crap video from YouTube became, became the main application. That's what people do with uh, uh, you know, their time, is watch these silly videos and, and consume all our, our bandwidth. But you know, that's, that's what happens, and that's what they're willing to pay money for. So, uh, uh, but it's really everything uh, <coughs> that you sort of want to do. And the, and the key enabler of that was the fact that you have it in your pocket. So, one of, the th one of the better thoughts that I had in my life, even if I say so myself, uh, was when I was uh, vice president of research for Olivetti in the days of, uh, of Olivetti's heydays when Olivetti was the number one PC producer in the U.S. and I, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in Europe. And I categorized um, <clears throat> computers not by their uh, CPU or memory or even a user interface or software, but I categorized them by where they lived. So it was the computers that lived in the air-conditioned room, the computers that lived at the desktop, the computers that lived in the, uh, in the briefcase, which were the laptops, uh, the computers that I thought were going to live in here, uh, so they were in your jacket. I was wrong. They actually live in a pocket. You know, they were smartphones. And then the computers that live on your wrist. 
and maybe we'll just see that uh, around the corner because there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, iWatches or um, um, the, these Nike bands, which um, are really very primitive and they could be a, a lot more interesting. And they, I think they will be um, next year. So one of the many ways I made, made incorrect uh, um, uh, um, projections was this thing about mobile phones and Europe. Uh, remember, just a few years back, Europe had it all. We had a company that had provided 40% of the world's phones with Nokia. It was a totally dominant, uh, the, the dominant uh, mobile phone company. Not only that, we dominated and still do uh, the infrastructure. Ericsson is the number one provider of mobile uh, infrastructure in the world. And that at, at that time, I thought that with... Um, a Symbian, we had a reasonable operating system that could dominate that as well. So I was convinced that it was Europe's uh, time in the sun and we are going to uh, take this away from America that is normally the technology lead. And I was wrong because Apple uh, completely uh, changed the game. And Europe, uh, which of course had the leading uh, infrastructure as well, you mustn't forget, 3G first rolled out, well, first of all, is a European uh, technology and was filled, first rolled out in Europe. So we actually had the better uh, mobile infrastructure for a very long time, also better data infrastructure, again, that has moved to uh, the US with 4G and LTE. Very satisfyingly for, uh, uh, for me as the godfather of the arm is that when the wave changed from the PC to the uh, smartphone wave, there was a change in processor as well uh, from uh, Intel to ARM, and I'll go into uh, this in a moment. Uh, this is a smartphone on steroids, um, which is all that tablets are. Uh, it is not a um, shrunk down PC, actually. It's a, uh, you know, a, a smartphone on steroids. Uh, most tablets that are being sh sh shipped at the moment uh, are basically uh, have a, a smartphone architecture. And there is a new entrance to the uh, computing environment uh, because the smartphone itself is, is really a hopeless computer and a useless computer. Uh, that, that, that nobody would, uh, would really pay uh, the amount of money for that they are, were it not for the uh, mobile data connectivity back to data centers. So really all the interesting things that smartphones are used for uh, happen in there. And um, as you see, they're preferably built in places where there is a lot of snow because the number one problem that data centers have now is not performance, is not storage, it's energy consumption. And that is one of the reasons uh, why at ARM uh, we're also very keen to produce uh, server CPUs and you'll see uh, a number of ARM-based servers also appearing in data center for the sole reason of uh, much lower uh, power consumption, and both HP and Dell now produce ARM-based uh, servers. But there's also, again, a move towards the human in the, in the user interface. So voice recognition uh, has uh, really become uh, good enough uh, now to be useful. Uh, Siri is a good example, but any of you who know a little Cambridge company called Eevee, uh, which is uh, a much better version of Siri because it has uh, you know, a fancy ontology of 20,000 concepts and it can, as, as I've demonstrated to some of you and uh, I'm happy to demonstrate it later to those of you who are interested, uh, you, you can ask it questions like um, who was president of the United States when Obama was a teenager. Not only is it very impressive that it recognizes your, your voice, you know, because this is quite a fancy sentence, uh, but uh, disambiguating or, or interpreting what, what this means and giving you the right answer is, um, you know, is, 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 is interesting uh, that you can do this on a, uh, on a mobile phone. Uh, but there's also been a, a revolution with touch, uh, as, uh, as you well know, and eye tracking uh, is about to, I think, make a major entry in, into user interfaces. We're beginning to see it with the Galaxy 4, where there's very 
uh, very primitive eye tracking, as you probably know, if you look away from a Galaxy 4, it shuts down, and since power consumption and battery life is such a key thing, that's actually quite a nice uh, thing to have. Uh, the other thing that's nice is if you, you know, if you come towards the bottom of what you're reading, wouldn't it be nice if it scrolled up? Uh, well, eye tracking can do that uh, for you. But not only do we have touch and we have eye tracking, we're actually beginning to have lots of other things that uh, um, make uh, smartphones uh, much more usable. Accelerometers, GPS, maps, and an explosion of apps. There are now, uh, I think, over 650,000 uh, um, apps, uh, both on the, uh, on the iPhone and on, um, on Android. And the browser, uh, of course, has become a sort of main interface of doing interesting things with um, smartphone and, uh, you know, the story about the search and, uh, and social. And a new phenomenon has come up. Uh, one of the things I, I always look for when making an investment in a company is whether, the, whether there are clean interfaces both at the top and uh, at the bottom and at the top. So is there a clean interface to the suppliers uh, that the company buys things from? And is there a clean interface in terms of selling their products that people can build uh, things on, on top of? Uh, and uh, it's, it's very, th this Facebook home thing is, is an interesting new phenomenon where um, a company uh, that is you know, quite widely known and widely used, has got a billion users, may be able to um, recruit all the infrastructure that has been built up from, you know, hardware to software, operating systems, browsers, everything, and just do the top layer and pinch the, the user from all the people that have done the hard work underneath. Whether it really will be as successful as they hope or not, I don't know. But the fact that it is possible to put a veneer on top and pretend to the user that what they're using is actually all Facebook, when <laughs> really they've, they've just uh, done a tiny, tiny sliver on the top, is an interesting uh, new phenomenon. Uh, Twitter, of course, is another one. I have a, a very exciting little uh, investment in a company called Datasift uh, in, uh, in the UK, uh, which has access to the entire Twitter firehose. And what, and they, they, they give you an answer within 100 milliseconds to the following questions. So they've got very, very fancy filters on the entire uh, firehose, on all the tweets in the world. They'll be able to tell you who uh, in Ohio, uh, male between 25 and 45, has just seen a Mitt Romney ad and did a negative or positive tweet about it. Uh, and this was of some interest to the Obama campaign. But it does it in real time. It also has uh, two years of history of the, of the tweets now uh, and can use a slider to go back in time over two years to see when Mitt Romney ads had run in the past or when Nike had a, uh, an ad in, in, in the past and how people reacted to that and, and plot the time series. And it's actually the time series that uh, might be of greater interest than, the, than a single data point. However, the biggest thing, in my opinion, uh, uh, going forward, and again, uh, you know, it's very difficult to make uh, uh, predictions, especially if it's about the future, uh, is about health. Yeah, you know, we, we all care a lot about uh, our own health and the health of our, of our loved ones. And for the first time, I think uh, the whole computing infrastructure will make a huge difference to both health costs but also our ability to provide uh, health um, uh, uh, support for people for healthy lives. You're just beginning to see it with health sensors on uh, mobile phones um, that do heart rate, they do um, you know, your, your running speeds. They, they do ECG. Uh, uh, Vinod showed me, um, Vinod Kozlo showed me a very interesting, very impressive application where you basically take your two thumbs um, at the back of a of a smartphone, and on the front, uh, you get really quite an accurate uh, ECG, uh, glucose levels, etc. But the important thing is, it's 24/7. You can do, you can measure all these things 24/7. And uh, my my guess or my gut feel is that the that the the really interesting uh, thing going forward is not the uh, 
time series 24-7 of, say, your heart rate or your glucose level or your, 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 blood, gas, uh, your, your blood gas uh, levels. But the change is in the vector. So it's really the signature of maybe half a dozen of these very simple uh, health parameters uh, that, that might contain the really useful information for you. And it's that where machine learning, I think, will have a, a field day because we'll have the data. You know, we'll have these time series. People haven't had these time series. I mean, even, even a 24-7 heart rate time series is quite hard to get hold of. If this becomes automated because it's just one of the things that people buy with their smartphones and all of a sudden you've got thousands and, and millions of them, uh, just imagine what machine learning uh, can do with that, especially if it's correlated with uh, you know, glucose levels, blood uh, respiration, um, your running rate or whatever, because you know, if your heart rate goes up because you've just been running up, up the stairs, you know, what's the big deal? Of course it, has, it does. But when your heart rate really, uh, uh, you know, your, your heart starts racing and you're sitting by a desk, you know, what, what, what is going on? Why, why is this? So I, I think that's, uh, that's very exciting. And uh, we, we do have one example of this already. Uh, I don't know how many of you heard that lovely story of uh, Siri. The people in Scotland compared, uh, complained bitterly about Siri not working very well in Edinburgh. Uh, and uh, they rang up uh, Nuance and said, you know, why does this not work for a Scottish accent? And they said, just wait a few weeks. And of course, what happens is the speech recognition is not done in Edinburgh or on your smartphone. The speech recognition is done in Boston at, uh, at uh, Nuance, and they are collecting all the speech samples. So as, Siri, uh, as more and more people have used um, Siri and uh, voice recognition in Edinburgh, it collected all the speech samples from the Scottish people and could tune itself to when, when they saw another one coming in from Edinburgh, then he yeah, is one of those funny guys, you know, I, I know. I know. So, uh, you know, data sets are important. So let's come to the meat of the talk, which is why I think machine learning, you know, it's, I've got a really hard task here. I've got to convince you that machine learning is very important for, uh, machine, for uh, the computing industry. Same story again. Uh, it's not uh, one billion, but tens of billions uh, of um, things uh, per year. Uh, it's all about big data. Interesting point about the price. You know, uh, I told you phones are available at, uh, at zero cost, really. So where do you go from there? You can't really go below zero. Well, in a way, you can. And the thing that is happening with the price in the Internet of Things and the, and the uh, ubiquitous uh, thing is that the price actually is no longer associated with, with the computing element. The price is a thing that you'd buy anyway, like a car. Or, or glasses that you need, or, um, you know, or a thermostat. It's just that now it has these, these nice new functionalities uh, that, that make it uh, really useful, because it becomes part of the environment. And, and the machine learning bit uh, is, uh, is, 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 you know, I'm just listing a, a, a few of them, and then I'll, I'll talk about biology, which I think is the, is the really exciting bit. But um, uh, before we go on to that, uh, um, <coughs> Peter Lee uh, provided this uh, slide for me, uh, which is the only slide I've managed to dig up on software complexity, because this thing is all about complexity as well, if you remember my pretentious part of my talk in the, in the beginning. And uh, there are lots and lots of graphs that I can show you on the exponential growth of processing power, of memory, of uh, networking speeds, but it's very hard to get hold of um, uh, of slides on software complexity. And the red one is uh, integrated circuits. And there seems to be something very magic about a billion. Uh, you know, once you get about, uh, uh, above a billion, things get really interesting. Billion neurons, um, billion instructions per second, uh, gigabyte, uh, uh, you know, um, a gigabit per second. Uh, things get interesting. And we're just getting to the billion. Uh, you know, the, the latest uh, Xeon processor needs about a uh, a billion lines of code. I understand uh, Windows is now at uh, 60 million uh, lines of code. And interestingly, you see that the design integration and texting in months 
it's actually been quite constant. So we've made fantastic progress with, with tools to allow this additional complexity to not uh, cripple uh, the, uh, the production of it, with one exception, <laughs> which is the aerospace industry, which is the, uh, uh, the blue bit. The, the green bit, by the way, is the, is the car industry, which is interesting. They, they're actually um, doing very complex things, but they're doing it more and more efficiently. Here you've got the Google Glasses, uh, which uh, I'm very excited about because, uh, and the thing that excites me about it is not the first version which I'm wearing here, but the one with eye tracking. Because if, uh, and I don't know how many of you have followed the Google Glasses, but it's, it's not glasses that give you a virtual reality or things that you, or, or, or augmented reality, but it's a, it's a display up here on the right that you look up, that's why I have this funny um, look on, on, on my face. And, and the thing that I'm really excited about is actually that with eye tracking, this allows you to make selections not in a virtual world, but in the real world. So if I look at the, the light here, uh, I might get the menu of things that I can do with the lights. I can turn it down, I can switch it off. When I look at the TV, I can change the channel. If I look at the air conditioning, you know, I can change the temperature, etc. So it allows a more human uh, interface with the, with the real world. Um, similar thing with the Google car, uh, or with, with lots of cars that, uh, uh, that now appear that can drive themselves. Um, you know, there's, there's tremendous amount of machine learning, but also a tremendous amount of data that needs available, because a Google car, at least, uh, uh, which, I, which I drove in uh, recently, can only drive along roads uh, where uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, good street, street view information. And, you know, a very iconic little uh, Silicon Valley company that does thermostats. Uh, you know, you've got to have a thermostat, but this one learns, you know, whenever you, you tweak it, it remembers what, uh, what you've done. So, what is the big, what's the big deal about machine learning? Well, it really makes the, makes the, the Internet of Things, the everyday things that you interact with uh, so far, much more user-friendly, much more... Um, uh, uh, human. But the big thing, uh, which is the rest of my talk, is the, uh, the effect this will have on health. So quickly, stepping back and looking at the clashes between these waves, why does the new wave always win over the old one? Higher volume, lower price, performance good enough? It doesn't need to be as good as the, uh, the best performance of the last wave. New and more apps and new users and more human. Uh, PC, mobile phone, is, is just the, the, the change that we're seeing right now. And the last uh, uh, point here is actually an interesting one. Who would have thought that SD cards would become the main storage uh, device, but 64 gigabytes, hey, you know, can do lots of things with 64 gigabytes. Intel versus ARM is a risk versus uh, CISC story, actually. Uh, the only reason why the ARM exists is that we went to Intel uh, and I asked them if we could have the 286. Uh, uh, which we thought was a you know, perfectly reasonable process. Uh, processor that just screwed out uh, the pinout because they put both the address and the data bus on the same pins, and we said nobody can make a sensible computer out of that, but if you give us the chip itself, we'll do our own pinout, and maybe we can make something of it. And they said, get lost. So we said, well, you get lost, we'll do our own. It's the only reason why the arm exists. And then I gave two advantages to the design team that neither Intel nor Motorola nor AMD ever managed to give to their design teams. And the two advantages were, number one, I gave them no people. So it's the only processor in the world that was designed by two people, albeit very smart ones, Steve Ferber and uh, Sophie Wilson. And the second advantage I gave them was no money because we didn't have any. So the only way they could do this is keep it really, really simple. Uh, this, the arm, the original arm was 30,000 transistors, which was the same number of transistors as the Z80 at the time, which was the main 8-bit processor. The difference was that we managed to get 20 times the performance out of those 30,000 transistors that the Z80 did. So it was a real architectural breakthrough, which led to a world record of, of making us the world record holder of MIPS per watt which was not a design team, it was a design goal, it was a side effect. 
I mean, the, our, our Acorn computers were mains powered. We didn't care about the power of the, of the processor. But it was so, so simple. And if you allow me one anecdote, uh, we, we, we actually, after, you know, the arm came back and I bought two bottles of champagne in, in uh, expectation that the arm would work first time. It just shows the naivety we had at the time. This was a completely new processor. It had never run before. We put it in the circuit board, and, and two hours after this chip arrived, it said, hello world, I am an arm, which meant the processor worked, the instruction set worked, the, um, the basic interpreter that we wrote of an instruction set that we never had worked well enough, to, and the video interface and everything, worked well enough that an hour after the processor that had never existed before arrived as its first piece of silicon, and then up there, and I opened the bottles of champagne, and we were all uh, very happy about that. And then we measured the power consumption. So we <coughs> unsoldered the, the power pin, put a, an amp meter between the power pin and the power supply, and measured it. And uh, the recording was zero. So we thought, well, you know, this, as, a, as a physicist, you, you don't believe measurements like that. Uh, and we said, why, why would that be? And then we realized that the power pin actually wasn't connected to anything. It was a fault on the, on the board. <laughs> there was no power there going to the ship. So why did it work? And the answer was that the leakage currents from the, from the data bus and all the other buses was enough to power up the, <laughs> the, the chip and make it work. So we knew we were on a good thing on the power consumption side. <laughs> so uh, Intel versus ARM, oh, well, we, we have a good market share in mobile phones now. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you round it up, if you're sort of a mathematician and you, you round things up, if they're more than uh, 0.5, we actually have 100% market share. Uh, in, in 2012, we shipped over 9 billion arms, which is more than people on Earth and more than Intel has shipped in its entire history. We have an ambition of shipping uh, over 100 billion in the next 10 years. And if you multiply 9 by 10, this is not an, an impossible uh, task. It's our first $20 billion company, uh, but the thing that people sort of least realize is that although ARM has become the world's most successful IP company, if you translate this into uh, dollars, because we know exactly the value of ARM chips that are being uh, th shipped through 330 licensees now, uh, the value of the ARM chip overtook Intel sales in the year 2010. So even in dollar terms, ARM is now a more important architecture than the uh, Intel architecture. And these are all the licensees, by the way, spot in the middle of it, uh, Intel. Intel is also a licensee of ARM. It's the only microprocessor they've ever licensed in. So I end up on biology. Uh, some of you might have followed ENCODE, which I think is uh, possibly the most important publication this century. Uh, it's a nature publication uh, basically brought about by uh, another investment uh, of uh, uh, mine called Selexa. Uh, you all know about Moore's Law, which is the um, white line. The cost of uh, gene sequencing followed Moore's Law very accurately for a very long time until two outstanding profs at Cambridge, uh, uh, Shankar Balasupramanian and David Klenerman, invented uh, sequencing by synthesis, uh, which um, uh, was, is the Selexa technology which we sold to Illumina. And look at this. It reduced the cost of doing a human genome from $10 million to now just above $1,000. So it's a factor of 10,000 in five years. I've never seen anything like it. The result of this was a total explosion of uh, available information, genomic uh, data information. It's, uh, here is a uh, a slide that uh, John West, who, who ran Selexa for us, produced for me. It's 22 petabytes a year. So this is one of the reasons why i am become such a believer in machine learning. We do not have enough people on Earth to uh, analyze this data. We've got to have automatic ways of making these gene association studies with uh, phenotypes. Uh, so why am I so excited about ENCODE? Well, well it explains what 80% of the DNA does. Just to remind you, when we did the first genome sequence, you know, the famous announcement with um, Bill Clinton and, uh, and Tony Blair, uh, when we finally had the first uh, sequence of the human genome, that explained what 1% of the DNA does, because only 1% of the DNA gets uh, translated. 
Uh, it's a big, it's, it's, it, there, there, there are 32 institutes that contributed to that. So big science is alive. Uh, uh, you know, just enormous amounts of data, really good stuff uh, here. But interestingly, they also used machine learning techniques. So one of the most interesting bits is that they have defined seven states of the DNA. And one interesting uh, one is that WE, it's the weak enhancement thing that nobody really expected to pop up in the cl classification um, analysis of, of ENCODE. These weak enhancers are, you, uh, I'm sure you remember, the uh, genes are sort of regulated by uh, uh, promoter sites just in front of the genes. And then there are enhancers that are a little bit upstream from, from the promoter sites that enhance the, the gene expression. But there are weak enhancers that are about 100 million base pairs away from it, but they're still clusters. So they're still enhancers that have a significant, they, they would not have shown up had it not been uh, for m machine learning. And then there's, there's a fun story to tell um, with um, a, a, an occasional seminar that I run uh, in Cambridge where I like mixing up computer scientists with uh, uh, biologists. And Chris came to the last one uh, just two weeks ago. And we learned the following thing from Shankar, no less than Shankar Palasubramanian, one of the people who uh, did Selexa uh, with me. He discovered a way of distinguishing between uh, HM cysteine, as I to say, as you know, the four basic pairs, only one of them. Uh, gets modified to uh, affect um, epigenetic uh, things. And uh, later on, they found out that, that they don't just get methylated. There is an additional modification that can happen, which is uh, hydroxymethylation, um, which enhances gene expression again, where methylation uh, inhibits it. There are a thousand papers out there on uh, methylation of cytosine. Uh, most of them say, well, it's uh, inhibitory, but some of them say, well, we see some enhancing effects as well. Now, all these papers were published before it was known that there was actually a modification to this methylation. There was also an HM version of cytosine. And Shankar, just a few months ago, found a way of clearly distinguishing between these two uh, states. So what do you do with all the papers, the thousands of papers that are out there, uh, some of which clearly will be wrong because they thought they had an MC when actually they were doing their research on HMC. You know, how do you go back to the data? The data themselves might still be interesting. It's just the conclusion was wrong. So what you need is an evidence engine. So um, if any of you uh, are willing to engage in, in this, even in, in, in maybe its frivolous uh, instantiation of uh, what, what I call a sort of TV evidence engine or a TV veracity engine, uh, which I would like to see where you, at the bottom of the TV screen you have a little graph that goes between zero and one uh, when politicians talk and uh, one means that uh, you know, what they say is uh, you can actually find some evidence for zero is you find some evidence against what they've just said. And I'm sure most of it, it would be at half because you can find neither evidence for or against what they have said because uh, most of their talk is content free as we know. Uh, <clears throat> so it wouldn't it be nice to have that in real time? Speech recognition certainly is good enough to do that and I think we ought to be able to find evidence for or against in real time. I just want to end uh, my talk with one of the reasons why I got so interested in, uh, uh, in uh, machine learning and its Gaussian uh, processes, and it's this uh, unicycle uh, that uh, Carl Rasman produced. This unicycle knows nothing about physics. The only thing it knows about is that it's good to stay upright and it's a bad idea to fall over. Uh, the control engineers have been trying to make progress with that, doing all the fancy differential equations, and haven't gotten anywhere. And Carl has a, a, a Gaussian process with 18 parameters. And as you can see, on trial number five, this thing stays up for an amazing <laughs> period of time. So this convinced me that here we've got something which humans are very good at. And when it comes to riding a bicycle, we are the kings. Uh, and it's very hard to make a computer ride a bicycle very well. Here we've got a machine learning environment that for the first time can learn how to ride a, a unicycle faster than a human. So I told you a little bit about the EDSEC, six waves of computing, the clashes between these waves, and that uh, uh, you know, they are significant. That, In my opinion, machine learning is the sort of key uh, uh, technique that will unlock uh, the sixth wave. And if any of you uh, is interesting, 
uh, interested in building the evidence engine that I described, um, I would be happy to finance it. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you. That's uh, really very interesting. I, I think we have some time for, uh, for a few questions. Um, and maybe if I can start. Um, I was struck early in the talk uh, where you made a little jab at the uh, old feature wars in the PC wave. Um, so is there something equally distracting today? Uh, are there things that we're focusing on too much today that... Uh, uh, well, if you, uh, uh, there are quite a few of, of these. For example, uh, well, you're just seeing the end of it, that people buy uh, PCs on the clock rate of the processor. And I think it was Butler in a conversation yesterday that says, you know, is, is it important that uh, we have more and more processing power? Uh, and the answer is probably no, because the important thing is you need to reach a certain threshold. And once you're above that threshold, this really be doesn't become the key issue anymore. And it's one of the reasons for the success of the ARM. Uh, there is no doubt that the Intel processor is a more powerful processor, but is it really needed? You know, can you do most of the things that you can do uh, uh, with an ARM? And there are lots of these stories also in software and the environment and, uh, you know, cameras and, um, uh, and videos. And Great. So, uh, questions? Yes, XP. Oh, this is a great talk. Thank you. Um, we all agree machine learning is important. Um, for the application, where would you actually bet on the application for the next big wave? Health. Thank you. Any other questions? If you can just elaborate on that, uh, the reason why I say this is, one is, in biology, it's so hard to get solid data. And genomic data now is very solid. Uh, you know, we, we really can call base pairs with great accuracy. We can get these, hunt down these SNPs, and uh, you know, it's, it's one of the few things where a whole, you know, science like biology all of a sudden found a very sound, hard uh, data set. And on the other set, uh, on the other hand, we've got the the, the enormous amount of medical records uh, which uh, characterize phenotypes. So you've got two um, humongous data sets and we don't really know how to, how to link them up. And there isn't enough brain power uh, in humans, uh, you, you know, and enough humans to do that. So doing that correlation uh, and, you know, starting off with association studies, but there is, there is a lot more to biology than just association studies, I think is where the real meat is, because uh, if you look at the, uh, the amount of money that people are willing to spend on their own health, it will, you know, make our spend on computers or anything else pale into insignificance. That's where the money is. You know, each, um, during your talk, each wave was getting more and more human, so to speak, um, and so health certainly goes in that direction. Uh, another one that some people might argue would be towards social. Uh, so do, yes. you see, do you see that also? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, well, you know, Facebook, of course, and, and, and Twitter are good, uh, good examples of that. Uh, but how much m money would you spend on social compared on your own health if you knew that it worked uh, you know, because at, at the moment? I don't know if you know about that uh, rather distressing uh, statistic that if you take a drug, any drug, on average, it works on 30% of you. And 70% uh, of the time, it, uh, it either doesn't work or you get uh, negative side effects. It's one of the dirty secrets of the, of the drug industry. Great. Um, yes, there's a question here. Uh, Herman, yeah, very exciting talk, very optimistic. Um, but there's no sign in your talk about the sort of dark side, the malware, the botnets, Stuxnet, cyber warfare. What's your take on that? Very worried. I, I didn't, uh, since I'm a perennial optimist, I, I don't dwell on this, but there are two, two things that really worry me. Uh, one is all that dark uh, cybersecurity thing, and as you know, the, the cyber attacks are just exponentially uh, increasing. And it's actually one of our uh, investment uh, focuses um, is, is, is cybersecurity and, and the trust zone in, in the arm is an initiative that we started 10 years ago 
uh, to help with that because you really also, also want the hardware anchor for, uh, for whatever you do in cybersecurity. Uh, uh, but there is, there, is an, uh, there is another thing, which is drones. You know, drones are so easy to build now. Uh, again, like uh, with, uh, you know, with, a, with, a, with a Facebook homepage, uh, all the, the building blocks are out there. So if you're a, a smart guy, you can build yourself a, a drone for a few hundred dollars. Now, if you can build a drone for a few hundred dollars, you can build thousands of drones and then you know, make them do things together, um, like um, you know, invade a, a city or, or something, and, and, and you just can't shoot them all down. So, so there are quite a few scenarios which are quite worrying. A general uh, way of expressing this fear is, is one of intrinsic time scales, uh, 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 intrinsic time uh, constants. And this is something, this is a thought that I, I actually first had uh, some 20 years ago at a Harvard sem seminar where it, it struck me, and, and it's obvious that when it, you, you think about it, that w whenever you want to control anything, you've got to have levers with time constants that are shorter than the system that you're trying to control. And what we've done here is we, we, we've put so much effort and energy and money into building a system that has shorter and shorter time constants. And so things can happen faster and faster and faster. But we have not uh, made almost any investment in investing in the levers that will allow us to stop the system going awry uh, you know, in all kinds of uh, uh, ways. At, at that time, 20 years ago, I thought of uh, you know, a mad... Um, Israeli or other tank commander, you know, it needs to be somebody who is, who is a bit mad but also very intelligent, um, you know, putting out on the, uh, on the internet, uh, you, you've seen this horrible thing that has just happened, send me a hundred dollars and I sort it out and, you know, a few minutes later he's got a hundred million dollars and with a hundred million dollars you can do a lot of damage, you know, building, you know, a thousand drones or so. Sorry, I've gone, gone on for, for long enough. There are lots of bad Scenarios. I think we have time for uh, one more question. Yes. Uh, thanks for your talk. So every wave is defined by both a user interface, a software, well, a usage, and a hardware. And I was wondering, in general, is there one of these three elements that leads the way and begs the need for the other two? So do we have new user interface, and from these new user interfaces, we can think of new usages, which begs the need for new hardware, or do we have advances in hardware, which suddenly opens the way for new um, I think usages? The, uh, I think the right way to think about it is, is this threshold uh, way. You know, are the, under, uh, are, are the layers below good enough so that you can build whatever you want to build on top of it? And, but the, the really exciting bit is the appearance of new user interfaces or y new APIs, where, and that's why I rather cheekily talked about the Kolmogorov uh, complexity uh, in the beginning of the talk, that what you really want is you, you want a model, you, you want a, a, a set of, uh, you want to be able to express yourself at such a high level that with, with very few you know, commands, uh, you can rely on the system doing the right thing for you and you can express yourself at a, at a very high level. So you shift the complexity towards the system away from uh, what you have to do. And, and, and figuring out the clever, clean interfaces that allow you to do that, I think, is the, is the agenda. Well, uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And I guess we'll all be looking for our next great investments. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you.